Good morning. Welcome to worship at Meadow Oaks Baptist Church. I think we're three for three. I had made a joke a few weeks ago that if we had this great weather, if we could just bottle it up for a few more weeks, and we've been very fortunate. It's another gorgeous day today, isn't it? And uh, it is uh, wonderful to see each of you here. We want to extend a special word of welcome to any visitors or guests that we have today. We're thrilled that you're with us as well, and we look forward to getting to know you better. Uh, we've got uh, some of our UMHB students back again this week. I can personally attest these are some, to the fact that these are some of the best and brightest at UMHB. <laughs> you will want to um, uh, certainly welcome them and get to know them. They are uh, wonderful uh, students. You, you did let them know that this visit didn't have anything to do with the grades, That's right. That's right. <laughs> Actually, Pete, they haven't filled out their faculty evaluation forms yet. That's why I've, that's why I said all those nice things about them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, um, in our search for a um, uh, someone to fill in at the piano this week, we were driving along and found somebody holding up a sign that says we. <laughs> We, we'll play piano for food now. Uh, actually, Carol and I are thrilled that Ben's in for the weekend from Atlanta, uh, and even more thankful that he was willing to, to play for this for us uh, this weekend. But uh, all right, let's, uh, if you will, uh, take the yellow sheet out of your bulletin. I do want to call to your attention uh, some of the prayer requests, both for the congregation and, and beyond. We do have uh, a number of concerns within our uh, faith community. Of course, we want to continue to remember Deb Barnes and Henrietta Cox in our prayers. Um, we have a number of needs within the congregation as well. Uh, of course, keep the pastor search committee in your prayers. I'll have more about that process at our church conference next week, but uh, we, we met this past week and we're ready to put an ad out. So we're moving along with that process. So uh, that's good news, but please be in, be in prayer for that process as well as our search for a piano accompanist. Uh, uh, looks like we've got a little more money in the, in the building fund or the sanctuary renovation fund, so we celebrate uh, that as well. We have some homebound and nursing home folks we want to continue to remember. Do we have an update on Shirley? I thought there were some new developments with her. Do we? Don't. She's doing good. She, she, she meets via Zoom for Sunday school. Okay. She was there today. She said she felt good. Great, great. So good news on, on, on Shirley, and it sounds like she's more technologically adept than I am if she's zooming in on... Uh, Okay. Okay. Some uncertainty about ownership of where, where she's staying. All right. We have a number of uh, family members and others we want to keep in our prayers as well. Helga's granddaughter and son, um, and then of course Jane Brown's sister-in-law that who lost a great grandbaby. Uh, any update, David, on uh, your sister and brother? We can take them off the list. That's that's good news there. All right. Uh, continue to remember John Dowdy uh, and uh, Brenda's former pastor's wife, Janine. All right. Uh, we'll have more about the global mission offering in a minute, but let's continue to keep our uh, missionaries in our prayers as well as other ministries that we support as a church. Uh, and then finally, we have, uh, of course, always... Uh, many things to pray about in our global community. You may have seen the news this morning as well about the Christian missionaries that were uh, kidnapped in Haiti. Uh, so the, uh, the political strife and uncertainty continues there. This has become a, a common act among a, a number of gangs who, uh, by the latest word I saw in Port-au-Prince was about 50% of the city is sort of controlled by uh, various gangs at this point and so a lot of uh, just uh, uh, uncertainty politically and socially and this these kidnappings have become increasingly common so we want to uh, pray for a, a peaceful outcome in that situation. All right, any other prayer requests we need to be aware of? 
If not, uh, Martha's got an announcement about global missions. I do. In your, in your uh, bulletin, you will find an insert about the offering for global missions. We will begin this today and then move on into, uh, I think into about mid-November, something like that. We'll be, uh, so if you don't have the money today, if you don't have what you want to bring today, feel free to bring it later. But uh, this will give you a little idea of the ways that you can pray for our missionaries. And uh, all of this money goes to keeping these missionaries on the field, wherever it is that they serve. So uh, please offer your prayers to the Lord. And as you pray for the missionaries, ask God how you can support them. And uh, you'll find your, the envelopes are on the ends of the pews. So we didn't put envelopes in with the bulletins, but there are envelopes at the ends of the keys. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, I did speak with a couple of our missionaries, Brittany and Casey. I say speak, it's all messaging and texting. So, uh, But I did uh, talk to them last night, and they are getting back with us on a date where they can come and talk about their work in China. So we're excited about that. Brittany used to be one of our church gals. We used to have a college group that my husband and I got to teach and Brittany was a part of that crowd. So it's good to, to uh, looking forward to having her back here. And thank you all so much for your support of missions. Thank you, Martha. Uh, another announcement. Um, Ginger said there will be a sign up, this sign up sheet in the fellowship hall during cookie time today. For those of you who plan to bring your car or uh, for trunk or treat on Halloween uh, night from 5.30 to 6.30. So we'll be using this parking lot again over here. Uh, and I'm sure they will still welcome candy donations for that too. So uh, if you're going to bring a car though, if you would sign up or email Ginger, just let her, let her know after church today. We have our regular weekly activities this week, Tuesday morning Bible study at 11.30, Wednesday night meal at 5.45, followed by Bible study and then choir after that. Church council meets today at 4 in preparation for next Sunday's church conference, which will be right after the worship service. And then we'll also have potluck dinner um, before we enter into our time of meeting. So as I jokingly like to say, not only be in prayer for the business of the church, but also what you might bring for the, uh, for the meal. All right, any other announcements we need to be aware of? If not, let's join our hearts and minds together for worship.
reading from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Pray with me. Our God and our Father, we do bless your name. What, what you have created in us, that is your image, with that we bless you. And Father, we ask humbly that you bless us this day. Bless us with memory of what you have been about since the beginning. Bless us with, with wisdom earned in our experiences. Bless us, Father, with the fellowship that we can, we can enjoy as we, as we learn more not only about each other but about you because of this community you have knit together. So this morning we offer ourselves to you, Lord, and ask to hear from you. In the name of our Savior Jesus, I pray. Amen. David just mentioned that we offer ourselves to God. In our first hymn, 278, we offer ourselves to each other as co-travelers on a journey. And it's been so beautifully played about the old rugged cross that Jesus offered himself for us to save us so that one day we could exchange that cross for a crown. Let's stand as we sing of our journey together to reach that crown. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth 
Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our heart. We are all the work of your name. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual workshop. Worship. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We do have instructions for how to follow. They're hard. So, thankfully, we know that God will teach us. As you turn to Him 676, I pray that you will sing this as a prayer from your own heart that God will guide you individually and us corporately to find His will and to do it. pray together. Lord, we come before you this morning as your people, thankful for all that you have done for us, knowing, Lord, that you love, and we don't know quite why, but you do, that you chose to serve rather than to be served and we don't understand that and Lord you call us to be like you and Lord whether we understand it or not we ask you Lord to help us be so Lord we pray for our members today especially for Deb Barnes and Henrietta Cox and others in our church who may be ill and then for our many friends and family, Lord, on this list, and again, others that we may not know, who, Lord, have needs for comfort, needs for hope, needs for strength, needs for healing. And, Lord, help us to be those who care for them in, in, in ways uh, that we can help. 
We pray for our mission work around the world and, uh, Lord, the offering that we will be giving uh, to our missionaries. And we thank you for the missionaries that have come from our church, for Brittany and Casey and Amelia and Trey and wonderful things we hear about their work. We thank you for our local ministries, for helping hands and churches touching lives for Christ and family promise. Lord, we're aware that uh, we are only one church and that uh, we, have, we have many, many, many churches around us that support missions in many different ways. And Lord, we are just thankful that you inspire your people, your global people, to continue to take the word of God to others and to minister help and healing in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to do so and help us to be and to do our part. We uh, pray for the Christian missionaries in Haiti today that we've heard about. Lord, we pray for their uh, soon uh, return and uh, that uh, they will not suffer violence. Uh, we pray for your protection for them. Lord, we also pray today for Haiti and what a, a difficult place that has suffered so much um, and, uh, and look, we can't understand even in the, the level of poverty and the level of desperation that they are feeling and, and the things that have given birth to this uh, gang violence. And Lord, we just pray for Haiti today. And we know lots of people, lots of Christians are working there. We pray for their safety and we pray for their success. Lord, uh, we pray for other concerns that we have, especially for our pastor search committee and for our uh, piano accompanist committee and, and um, other things that we are hoping um, uh, that will guide our church into the future. But Lord, help us right now to enjoy the present moment and to be thankful that you are here and that you have uh, blessed us with your presence, that where two or three are gathered, there you are in our midst. Lord, lead us in worship today. Help us, Lord, to search our hearts. Help us to, to uh, be honest before you with our lives. Help us to, to redirect our path as you lead. Help us, Lord, to care. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And now with the words that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Old Testament reading this morning comes from Job 38, 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New International Version. When the Lord spoke to Joe out of the whirlwind, he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will ask you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the found earth's foundations? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked out its dimensions? Surely you know. Who, searched, who stretched a measuring line across it? And what were its footings set? And who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading this morning is from Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Um, in the, 
the Bibles in front of you in the pew that begins on page 1423. I'll be reading from the New International Version. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Our next hymn, 662, echoes part of what you've already heard about service. I pray that you will sing this from your heart or read it. It's not very familiar to us, the tune, but it is repetitive. So Ben's going to, as we stand, as you prefer, Ben's going to play through it all the way one time to give you a chance to hear what you are going to attempt to sing. sermon text is uh, Mark 10 35 to 45 we're picking up pretty much uh, near where Carol left off last week so follow as I read James and John the sons of Zebedee came forward to meet him and said to him teacher we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you and he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us, uh, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. 
But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that the that among the Gentiles, those uh, whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord, today uh, help us to hear your word and to follow it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of my favorite old movies is uh, The Maltese Falcon. Uh, you may uh, know that from uh, watching classic old movies, black and white. This is in the genre of the noir uh, movies, and it's a classic Humphrey Bogart movie. Um, and in the movie, the, the, everything centers around this uh, falcon that is being, people are trying to get their hands on because um, uh, it, it is very, very valuable. Even though it's painted black, what's underneath the paint um, is supposedly solid gold. So I want to play the last scene, and I'm hoping the technology doesn't fail me here. And you can't see it, but I, you can hear it. Okay. Don't you just love the end of that movie? Anyway, all right. So Ward Bond says, this is heavy. What is it? And Bogart says, the stuff that dreams are made of. Oh, I love the end of that movie. Well, today we're going to be talking about greatness. Uh, mega dreams. Greatness is the stuff that dreams are made of. When we look at this text today, we, we see a couple of guys who um, we, we have to have some sympathy for, James and John. I mean, after all, their nickname is Sons of Thunder, for crying out loud. You know, it's like from the beginning, they were destined to be great. And they come to Jesus, and uh, like it seems all the disciples at this point in the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus is moving toward the cross, he's been telling, him, telling them that he's got to go to the cross and die, and they just seem to be completely tone deaf. Right before this text I read, uh, he says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Then after three days, he will rise. He just said that. Then, G then James and John come and say, oh, by the way, can we sit at your right and your left hand? Um, and, and they just don't perceive a whole lot. 
Well, before we pick on them too much, uh, I think we need to recognize the fact that um, their request may have been brash, it may have been arrogant, it may have made everybody mad, but it wasn't really all that unusual. As a matter of fact, um, the desire for greatness is something that's pretty human. It's something that all of us can identify with. We all want to be important in some way. We all want to be significant in some way. We would all like to be remembered for something special. So um, when I think about these men, um, I have some sympathy with that. The, the only difference probably between maybe some of us and these two guys is that they put it into words. I mean, they just flat said it. Can, can we sit there in power with you? Um, you know, most of us are a little more uh, socially adept at that. It's like, oh, well, I, you know, don't, don't, you know, I, I'm not really interested in power, but, you know, if I can get it, I'd like to have it. No, anyway. Um, so it, it's, there's a tendency for us to kind of cover over the fact that, that we're not too different. Um, all of us, all of us want to feel important. Now, what I find here that's interesting, a, a number of things. One is that Jesus doesn't really rebuke them for the desire to be great. Now, he does have to deal with their question, and he very patiently deals with it. He says, uh, you know, um, um, I, I, I hear what you're saying, guys, but uh, I can't grant what you're asking me. I like, that's, so, that's so kind. He doesn't say, well, you stupid idiots. How, who told you that you're supposed to be sitting with me anyway? You know, or you're not supposed to be looking for greatness you know, we're all supposed to be poor and tr downtrodden as Christians. And you know, he doesn't say anything like that. It seems to be that he, he really does uh, appreciate or at least uh, um, understand their request. But he tells them, um, uh, I can't grant that. Um, and um, so when he speaks to them, he speaks to them in, in a kind of open way. He's, he wants them to come and ask. But the other ten, they overhear this request. And, uh, you know, th these guys are wonderful, close disciples who like each other, right? They never have any competition. Uh, no, no. These are people that Jesus has gathered from all diverse backgrounds. And they all have in mind that they're dealing with some sort of greatness. When they look at Jesus and when they see what he does and they see what he can do and they hear his words and now they've come to begin to expect that he is the Messiah. What's in their mind? Their mind is, man, we have bought a ticket on the, on the best uh, possible trip we could ever get. And that's a trip to greatness. And they are all looking for this. The only thing that the other 10 get upset about is that they didn't ask it first. Now, by the way, I need to mention that Matthew, and Matthew's, this is Mark's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew says it was the James and John's mother who came and asked. Well, I don't know. I don't know which, well, I don't know which way it is. We have it in both ways. Uh, some people think that Matthew was trying to soften uh, the, the uh, portrait of James and John being so ambitious. So it was their mother who asked. I, I don't know. It might very well have been uh, their mother who asked the question. Uh, but in Mark's gospel, we're going to go with Mark here. And Mark, it's, it's their request. Maybe they went to their mother and said, Mom, can you go ask? You know, whatever. Maybe we can harmonize it. Okay. So um, either way, they want it. They want it. They want to be um, recognized as great. Um, and so that sets up um, Jesus' pronouncement, Jesus speaking to the, all the twelve about this subject of greatness. You know, when we think about the Bible and this thing of dreaming about greatness, you can't help but go quickly, and my, at least I can't help, quickly go to the story of Joseph uh, in the Old Testament. 
Uh, there's plenty of precedent uh, among the people of Israel for dreaming about greatness. You know the story of Joseph where he is, uh, tells his brothers and tells his father that he has had dreams of, of all of them circled around uh, bowing down to him. And uh, it has the same effect that uh, James and John's request had. It makes them mad, makes them angry. Um, and that just shows how deeply all of us really do want to be great. And we're not real happy when somebody else is great and we're not. Uh, it's a very deep feeling that we want to be special. And unfortunately, that desire often involves uh, a competition, uh, a desire that we would be above others. And so uh, we're in this battle. But we all want it, and I think we all need, to some degree, importance. We all need significance. We all need to feel special. We all need to have a sense that we have made some difference in this world, or we're making a difference. I don't think that's illegitimate. And so when Jesus says later, he says, uh, but it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become megas, Megos, whoever wishes to become great, that's the Greek word for great. We, we think of that, we use that word, when, and today it's come into the parlance of like mega millions and mega this and mega that. It means big, it means large. If you want to be big, if you want to be large, if you want to be important, he doesn't say you shouldn't be wanting to do that. I find that fascinating. He doesn't say, now guys, you know, if you're following me, you need to quit wanting to be great. No, he says, if you want to be great, then, and he begins to tell them how, you must be a servant. So I think these deep emotions and this deep awareness that we have that somehow we need to be significant is something that I think is put there by God. I think, I think to be a part of the image of God is to have a, a deep sense that we need to be significant, that we need uh, something. And so, uh, but how does this work? Well, I want us to think about these ideas. First of all, I want us to think about the posture of greatness. And second, I want us to think about the vision of greatness. And finally, the heart of greatness. So what is the posture of greatness? Well, James and John come and they say, we want to sit at your left and your right hand. But true greatness is not about sitting, it's about standing. Their picture is uh, of, a, of a courtroom, uh, excuse me, a, a, a kingly court. And at the far end of the court is the king sitting on the throne, surrounded by their, uh, their servants, their, their people that help. And, but to their right and their left uh, of the king is going to be the most special people, the most special people in that kingdom. And they picture that they would be sitting on the right and the left. Um, and unfortunately, that's often kind of what we may think of greatness. Greatness is being in that place where everybody is going to come in and kind of look at us and say, wow, uh, we're, we're now achieved some position where, where we are going to be appreciated in some way like that. Um, but the real position or the real posture of, of, of service is standing. I'm, I'm thinking about things like, you, you know, you ever watch Downton Abbey, you know, okay. So you got the servants down in the, in the basement and you got the, the uh, lords and ladies all upstairs, but you never see the servants sitting in the presence of the, um, of the lords and ladies. They stand there, and what are they standing there for? So that they can be very quick to serve when they need to. If they're called upon, they need to be quick to, to go do it. If, uh, if they don't have anything to do right at the moment, they're standing there like soldiers around the room. 
Um, uh, just like our house, Martha. Isn't that great? We have those servants um, standing there. Well, we do have our dog, but he's not, he's not very. So the, this, this thing of this posture of sitting and having others wait on us is, is not the biblical idea of greatness. It's not Jesus' idea of greatness. As a matter of fact, if you really think about it, I don't particularly want to sit for the next billion years of eternity. I, I would like to be active. <laughs> and on this earth, the truth be told, that people who just kind of come and grind to a halt and do nothing, it's, it's, it's not very fulfilling. It's in the standing, it's in the working, it's in the caring that uh, we find uh, our sense of purpose. Because that's really what we're talking about is our sense of purpose, our sense of meaning. It doesn't come from having people praise us. It comes from being involved in serving and helping and caring. The second thing is the vision of greatness. The posture is standing. The vision is seeing rather than being seen. In that courtroom scene, in James and John's mind, they picture people looking at them, seeing them, admiring them. You know, I, I have to confess that a lot of my dreams of greatness have kind of involved, I'm talking about my literal dreams, people seeing me, okay, you know, seeing me do something. I, I think this is the problem. We, we, we in, when we start envisioning, when we start thinking about what it is to be important, when we think it's start envisioning what we need to do to be remembered, we, we, we are thinking about what other people think about us, how other people see us. And a lot of our lives are geared toward um, uh, that measure. What do other people think about us? What are these people going to think about me? I need to do these things so that people have a good view of me. And, and to some degree, that's not a, a terrible thing. But when it gets to the point where everything we do is to get the praise of others, to be seen by others uh, as important, um, we, we can get, um, we can become to be destabilized. Um, and we can become quite depressed if we don't receive it. But it's not about seeing, seeing, it's about, it's not about being seen, it's about seeing. True greatness, it, it comes from the attention that we give to others. It comes from the attention of seeing others. We're truly important only when we're paying attention to someone and their needs. Uh, one of the things that I teach and, and, and a lot of ministers uh, need to learn, and I think everybody, is, is how to attend to someone. Attending is, is the very first step in counseling. Attending involves your body, how you lean toward others, how you uh, show them that you are interested. You know, if, you don't, if you're not attending, what are you doing? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's kind of the way I am with Martha, you know, when she's talking. I'm kind of like this, you know. No. But when you're attending, it's the opposite. You are leaning forward. You are paying attention. You, your eyes, you, there's eye contact. You're looking at the person. You you're really are focused on them. Uh, and, uh, and you're listening. And you're listening to every word, even to the point that you could repeat it back. And that is when people feel really uh, accepted. And our role as servants is to give attention to others. Greatness is really in, involved in that. It's not about getting attention to yourself. As a matter of fact, the more you give attention to others, the more people kind of want to be around you. So it has this kind of double effect. It's like if I give you attention and I pay attention to you, people kind of feel feel strengthened and they like to be with you and so you get something back but real greatness is not just trying to get other people's attention because what happens when you're not around them it's all gone you know 
So we must give attention to others. And these poor guys, James and John, are, are really just wanting uh, to be able to sit down and have people uh, look at them. And finally, um, it's the, the heart of greatness. If the posture is standing and if the vision is, is seeing, what's the heart? The heart of greatness um, is self-sacrifice rather than self-indulgence. And this is really where Jesus focuses here. He says to, the, to James and John, you don't know what you're asking. It's almost like the passage in Job where God is responding to Job and he says, you, you don't know anything. Where were you when I created this world? So they don't even know what greatness is. Jesus has to say, you know, you want to be great. I, I get it. I understand that. Uh, but if you want to be great, it's not about self-indulgence. It's about self-sacrifice. That's how you become great. Now, in the ancient world, in the time of Jesus, in the Roman world, it really was the measure of, uh, of, of greatness was self-indulgence. You were seen as blessed by the gods if you were the emperor or if you had wealth. And so in that ancient world, everything operated according to how much you could get for yourself. Jesus came in teaching the kingdom of God, which was a polar opposite. To be honest with you, we're not all that different than the ancient world. Self-indulgence seems to be the rule of the day. And what can I get out of this? How can I run my own life? How can I be, some, be my own God, if you will? Instead, Jesus says the real greatness in this world is when you give yourself for others. When you realize it's not about being served, it's about serving. When you give your life so that others can live. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. You want a life free of pain. You want a life where you, 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 you have pleasure. But real greatness comes through pain. Now, I don't look for pain. He's not saying go out and try to find pain. He's just saying it, it's just a fact. When you really give yourself, it's not easy. It's not easy to have self-denial, to deny yourself. But that's where greatness is. True greatness requires putting the needs of others before you. True greatness is laying down our lives for others. You know, that passage in Hebrews speaks about Jesus learning, learning this himself, giving his life. He becomes the great priest in the order of Melchizedek because he gives his life as the sacrifice for humanity. And it talks about him having to learn that. I believe Jesus wanted to be great. That's why the temptations by Satan were so tempting. <laughs> he wanted to be great, and Satan says, well, if you want to be great, hey, I got a shortcut here. Just throw yourself off the temple. Fly around. Tell everybody you're the Messiah. They'll believe you. You know, Bow down to me, and I'll give you all the nations. You'll be great. Hey, just use your miracle power. Make everybody, feed everybody. You'll be great. I think those were temptations because Jesus genuinely wanted to be great. But what Jesus understood was that true greatness is something that's given only by God. And true greatness comes only when we serve God. And when we give our lives. Because we really believe, and this is the key, folks. This is the key. If we really believe that God created us to be these kind of servants. And that if we give our lives, that God will give us back our lives. If we really believe that, then we live very differently than this world. I, I quoted uh, that old movie at the beginning. I actually played it for you. Um, it's the stuff that dreams are made of. You know that quote? 
comes from Shakespeare. Now, I'm not much of a Shakespearean, but I discovered this. It comes from The Tempest, uh, one of Shakespeare's major plays. And at the end, Prospero makes this statement. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself. When he says globe, he means the globe theater of his place. Yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. At the end of the day, Greatness in this world is like a play that ends. It's like, it's like characters that fade to nothing. And all the people that gain greatness in the eyes of the world are just like characters that, dis, that, that go into the mist. But greatness in the kingdom of God, that lasts. That's the real life. The real life is when we live as if, as if the kingdom is here. Because that's where we're all going to be. In that real world. In some ways, Shakespeare was saying, the play is fake, but all of this life is also fading away. You better put your investment in something that's truly great. Jesus said what? Your treasure, uh, make heaven your treasure. Make it the pearl of great price. Do all you can to get it. And the way we get it is by serving and giving ourselves to one another. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this text. How many times you had to tell your disciples over and over and over again, it's not, it's not about trying to be somebody, it's about caring for others. It's about giving our attention to those in need. It's about sacrificing rather than getting. So many times you told us, Lord, and we still are trying to understand, we're still trying, Lord, help us, help us to be people that believe truly that the more we can give to others, the more we will receive and the more that we will have invested in the kingdom to come. We thank you, Lord. Lord, help us now in our time of commitment and lead anyone here that wants to make a commitment to Christ, to change the direction of their life, to know you better, or to be even just a member of this congregation. Lead us, Lord. Lead us all to follow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is Wherever He Leads, I'll Go, number 491. And let's stand together as the Lord leads. And I'll be waiting here if anyone would respond to the message.
day. And uh, Ben, anytime your parents want to fly you in to play, it's good. Uh, all right. Um, uh, we've got a church council meeting, town community, any other announcements? Cookies. 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 Cookie, cookie time. <laughs> How could I forget cookie time? Yes, that could you. That's just, <laughs> just a fact. Okay. So out the door, just in the fellowship hall, you can get uh, something to drink and a cookie and some conversation. Uh, get to meet some folks. So we invite you to do so. Uh, good to have everybody here. Let's do our benediction, which is our memory verse. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. That he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. Go and be